So good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending the Swarnt University FinTech Bootcamp. Uh, it's the first day of the FinTech, Boston FinTech Week. So I'm pretty sure you have erased your hard disks completely clean so that you can soak up and observe all the information you're going to be collecting over the next four or five days. Right. Uh, so today, what we're going to be doing is kicking off the first session of the Swarnt University Bootcamp. Uh, quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of Swarnt University? So we're going to fire our marketers. Uh, this is the first uh, thing, but uh, we have Rooney who's uh, helping out uh, today, and uh, he's going to be uh, answering any questions for any of the labs, which are going to happen over the next couple of days. So uh, this is going to be an uh, interesting session, series of sessions compared to some of the other sessions. You know, we are primarily taking fintech from a research and education perspective, rather than just you know looking at it from a perspective of here's just a nugget of information on a particular thing. So we are taking a comprehensive approach and looking at all the six themes you're going to be uh, listening to over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, so this is going to give you a foundation for some of the topics you're going to be uh, working through. Um, a quick intro: we are an analytics and fintech advisory. We're based out of Boston. We primarily work with large companies, federal organizations. Uh, we work with consulting companies, uh, and we primarily provide consulting services and education. Uh, we started out in 2013. Uh, most of our projects have been in the area of big data and analytics and machine learning. Uh, we've been helping our primarily financial companies uh, care of their infrastructure, uh, do due diligence from both technology and business model perspective. And we've also built in a bunch of training programs uh, both for the uh, CXO level folks, trying to build a strategy for analytics and digital transformation in their companies, and also for people who are interested in uh, building out the technical expertise within their companies. Uh, I come from a, a technology background, so my uh, graduate studies was all in uh, machine learning and engineering, and uh, from there I worked for uh, Citigroup, where I uh, done a lot of extra analytics, and when I started the session, I would some examples of uh, what FinTech was you know, 15 uh, years ago. And then uh, uh, for more than five years, I led the financial engineering consulting team at uh, a company called MathWorks. Anybody use MATLAB? Okay, so we have a couple of MATLAB users. No tech support questions on MATLAB, please. Uh, <laughs> that you can hold up for another day. Uh, but uh, I've also uh, been uh, affiliated with uh, Babson College. I'm a legend uh, professor here. I've been teaching here at Babson College for the past six years and uh, also at uh, Northeastern University. Uh, where I'm, uh, here I'm primarily teaching in the business analytics program and also in the MBA program, uh, but at Northeastern University I primarily teach in the information systems program. Uh, so uh, my call of fame is uh, we have like four, 500 plus data scientists and machine learning professionals in the industry who have taken my classes. And uh, you know, every time I uh, hear from them, they're saying, you know, that class actually made me focus on analytics and the title I have today is just because of that one class which was offered uh, out, of, out of eight classes which was offered like you know, five years ago. Um, so that's a little bit about me and uh, my company. Uh, I'm speeding up a little bit just because we have four sessions, six hours, over four days, and we have to cover a lot of information. And uh, what I'll do is uh, cover the material over the period of four days. And after the class, I'm going to be hanging around. So if there are any questions, you can ask them. Uh, first of all, I uh, need to acknowledge the support of Babson College and the FinTech Sandbox. Uh, they've been great uh, supporters uh, for both the FinTech ecosystem here in the Boston area, uh, but also uh, in terms of education and uh, outreach. Um, and um, to kick off the session, uh, oh, I just want to mention, uh, so this session was probably one of the few sessions or probably the only session which uh, collected donations and that was for a reason because uh, we wanted to collect the commitment fee just to make sure that you guys are going to be here. Uh, there's an option to just register for multiple programs and wanted to have that. And all the proceeds of what you have donated is going to support the analytics for our, for our past program we have. And uh, the program basically we host uh, free meetups every month. And uh, uh, if, in addition to that, we also offer free tickets for people in transition, so people who have uh, lost jobs and want to make it into fintech and machine learning. So whenever we post uh, public uh, workshops, we uh, offer tickets for those folks. And we have had more than 150 students for a way of this opportunity. So uh, thank you for your donation. Uh, it's going to go and support uh, that program. OK, um, so without further ado, I would uh, uh, like to tell you about what you're going to be doing uh, over the next four days. Uh, so what we were told was, you know, we have these four days and we have four different themes we're going to be focusing on in terms of various programming. 
So today's theme is uh, capital markets and investing and blockchain. Uh, so we're going to have uh, a, key, a keynote, and I'm going to introduce uh, Dee in a second. Uh, but uh, primarily, I want to kind of take a 60,000-foot view of what is fintech in the context of trading and investing, and then what is fintech in the context of blockchain. So I want to get you, you know, this is primarily going to be an introductory one for people who are getting oriented with fintech and want to kind of understand the big picture of these aspects in the context of fintech. So I'll give you those area, you know, introductions today. And tomorrow, um, we're going to focus on insure tech and uh, AI big data and analytics. I know it's a lot to cover, but uh, the primary purpose is to give you the key points. Well, what are the, you know, if you have to have five takeaways for each one of these themes, what are those five takeaways? Okay. And uh, tomorrow, again, uh, Dee's going to come back and they have done some uh, research on insure tech and he's going to talk about some of his research out there. And uh, uh, we're going to do some hands-on work later in the session. So the first lab is going to be building a sentiment analysis because we've been you know, hearing about sentiment analysis in the context of AI machine learning for a while. So we're going to give you a lab on how do you build out a sentiment analysis engine and uh, give you some of the basic tenets and I'll give you some guidance on how you go about building something on your own or uh, leveraging uh, things outside. On day three, uh, we're going to focus on wealth management and banking. And uh, uh, primarily, uh, we are going to take an approach of, well, if you are a large enterprise and you want to prototype or start out a digital transformation project and think about building, let's say, a mobile app for an investment planner, how would you go about doing it? Or if you're a startup and you're planning out, well, I have public data available, so how about I build out that? So I'll give you some guidance on how would you plan out that kind of a project. And then um, Darshak, uh, so an interesting story, you know, Darshak actually took my analytics class six years ago, and uh, he worked for a couple of uh, companies in here, and he has set up a fintech in the data science advisory bank in India, and he has been working on a lot of uh, fintech-related projects in India. So he's going to be coming in and talking about fintech in emerging markets, and his experiences of fintech in India. So he has an insider's perspective on what's actually happening on the ground. So he's going to provide the India perspective, uh, and we'll live stream him uh, on day three. And on day four, uh, we're going to look at two uh, projects. One is payments, you know, payment processing, transfers, and uh, then uh, stories. And then uh, the second one is lending. So we're going to look at uh, one of the various uh, platforms out there that are just lending. And I'm going to show you uh, how do you take publicly available data and build out a purpose model and a whole app built on Python and we uh, have a lab finally for uh, trends. So that's the packed agenda for the next four days. And uh, we will start out with our uh, keynote for the morning. Uh, Dushant uh, D uh, has been uh, in the financial services industry for more than uh, two decades now. And uh, he was an analyst at, uh, he, he used to, uh, uh, he's currently a director at uh, Rosenblatt Securities, uh, in their investment banking group. And for more than 20 years, he has been writing intense research on financial services, and uh, uh, he has been a good friend for the past 20 years. And whenever I have ideas and thoughts about fintech, I bounce off him. Uh, but also, uh, you know, his call of fame is in 2015, he made a brave decision to uh, you know, make a transition, and then he went to Sloan, and he was a Sloan fellow. And uh, for uh, more than two years, he actually did intensive research in various areas there. And he's going to share his thoughts about uh, fintech today. So, Dushan, please take the stage. Thanks a lot, Shri. We don't have a mic, right? We don't need. Uh, we don't need a mic. I okay. think it's getting recorded. And I can. But I have to move the slides from here. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody? Good How about one more time? Good morning. Good morning. You guys are going to be here for four days, <laughs> and this man is not going to give you a certificate easily, right? I've known him for a long time. He's going to make you earn it. But I mean, I, I commend you for. You know, you have a lot of sessions over the course of the week, which are mostly kind of high level sessions. But what, what Sri and Quant University is trying to do is really help you guys roll up your sleeves, spend four days of actually learning. Yeah, how do you actually do this stuff, right? And the stuff being, you know, develop technology to solve financial problems, right? Across all of these sectors. Um, I'm going to take it easy on you guys. You can just sit back, relax. There's no quiz at the end. Uh, I'm actually joined here by our managing director, Vikash Shah, who's also my boss. 
And Vikas and I are uh, part of the investment banking group at Rosenblatt Securities. Rosenblatt Securities is the largest floor broker on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, we are actually in the investment banking side, but our core business uh, is in the public markets. And then we've got a couple of other businesses as well. That's actually a picture from our offices in New York City. I work out of Boston, but Vikas is actually based in New York. Uh, so what I have is, you know, as, as bankers, we've got a unique vantage point on the industry in terms of, you know, looking at where broad trends are, where funding is happening. So all this venture capital money that's funding startups, you know, we get a chance and opportunity to not just talk to, you know, entrepreneurs like Sri, but also to the investment community, right? So what are investors investing in? A bird's eye view on where the market is in terms of funding cycle, right? This past week, we've seen news about WeWorks probably having its uh, you know, valuation, maybe pulling back the IPO. Is that an indication that things might change in the private market? In the public market, surely, but is that gonna have impact in the private market? So those are the kind of things we sort of consider. And of course, our bread and butter of our business is helping entrepreneurs raise capital, right? raise funding. Um, so we've got sort of you know, a unique view of the market in terms of seeing where things are across financial services. And in many cases, actually outside of financial services, one of the major trends that you know, I'll, I'll sort of try to touch upon is, if you look at the last five to eight years of activity in terms of funding in fintech startups, it's really been about addressing financial services issues within our industry. And if you see uh, a pattern developing, now the next wave seems to be enabling other industries, whether it's healthcare, whether it's insurance, whether it's travel, whether it's property, real estate, using financial services technology and things like payments to enable transformation in these other industries. So, you know, a lot of us use Uber and Lyft, right sharing companies. You could argue that right sharing, the way we think of it today, may not have been possible if you didn't have easy payment embedded in that right sharing process, right? So think about having to pay cash each time. If that was the case, then maybe, maybe right sharing may not have been successful as it has been over the last many years. So that's an example of embedding of financial services within another industry's business model and transforming that, that sector. So one of, the common, one of the themes that's emerging seems to be not just looking at FinTech within financial services, but using FinTech models and capability to actually transform other industries. Um, we'll try to keep it interactive. I've got a lot of data. I've got like five slides um, and we'll try to make those available for, for Sri and those uh, that are you know, looking at the street streaming session after, if you want to sort of keep, see a copy of that. But the objective here is not to give you a data dump. It's more about having a conversation and set you off in talking about bird's eye view, financial services, where we are, what's happening broadly in terms of trends, where's funding at, what is happening in the MA market, and then some aspects of, or a second order level of insight in what's happening in the subsectors within finance. So as Sri laid out, next four days, you guys are gonna talk about starting with capital markets today, insurance tomorrow, payments and lending, all the different parts of finance, and kind of what are the top one or two things that are happening in each sector? Because we might paint, you know, FinTech with a broad brush, but they are, it's basically many different industries within financial services and the dynamic in those industries is quite different. Industries being, I mean, subsectors. So just going through sort of, you know, six high level sort of insights from the way we are seeing things, you know, top left hand side, no particular order, is that FinTech funding overall is still pretty robust, right? I mean. The, Funds are coming in, venture capital uh, funds, whether it's private equity money, a lot of investments coming. You've seen a lot of these numbers. I'll present the numbers in the next slide. Having said that, they seem to be an indication that things seem to be maybe slowing down a little bit, right, from a funding standpoint, right? So investors have raised a lot of capital. Venture capital funds, PE funds have raised capital. There's a lot of dry powder, which means available capital that is not, not invested as yet. But even the amount of money that is being invested seems to be not on the exponential swing up. But they are in certain sectors and industries it is within finance, but in other areas seems to be sort of tapering off a little bit, right? Early indications. Um, having said that, if you look at 2019 first half numbers, if you sort of analyze that number, uh, we're gonna still be a level, you know, about 15, 20% higher than maybe we were in 2017, but about a 30% drop from last year. And that's, let me just explain, the last year numbers were astronomically higher because there was a massive $14 billion capital raised by Ant Financial. So that's kind of skewed up the numbers in 2018. And therefore the total number in aggregate looked to be a hockey stick growth over 17. But taking that you know, $14 billion number out, 18 was still a pretty good number. 
19, if you look at simply doubling the first two halves, uh, two half numbers, I mean, the first half numbers uh, twice as much, the run rate seems to be, will still be up over 2017, but a big drop over 2018. Um, the, the second point on the top right is, um, you know, as I said, there might be a risk of a private market slowdown. It's been 10 years since we've had a down market in the private market, right? And as, as those of you that might follow both the public market and the private market, both markets obviously are very cyclical. The private market tends to be much more cyclical than the, than the public market, right? If you sort of further look at second order of insight into the private market, the two major elements of the private market are the venture capital business and the private equity business, right? The other parts as well, the players, but broadly it's venture capital and private equity, right? The private equity cycle is much more tied to where debt is, right? If debt is cheap, private equity, that's the fund that private equity uses to actually make transactions. So the private equity business is very closely tied to the debt market. The venture capital market is much more tied to the equity market, right? So if we look at whether it's the China-US trade talks, maybe not working out, right? It seems to be, oh, it's hard to follow. Every week there's a new sentiment, right? One week we're up, one week we're down, right? And the market seems to follow that ebb and path. But if the public market gets jittery that are we going to have a final deal or not, they have macro risks involved, not to mention election year on all of those macro risks. The point is, if the public market tends to take a breather or there's a comeback or, or a sort of downturn in that space, that's going to impact at least the venture capital side of the business very, you know, very directly. Having said that, private markets respond to what's happening in the public market with usually a lag, right? So there's a lot of funding. Public equities go down. It's not like the private equity fundraising and investing so the slows down right away. There's a lag between that period of time. So just saying that they are, you know, clearly signs of what seems to be a pretty tense frothy market, high valuations, lots of funding, gradual sort of lowering of investing standards. So a prime example might be, you know, we, yes, we all need a Uber and Lyft. Maybe we need, you know, other parts of the world is, you know, Grab Taxi in Singapore, Ola in India, Didi Chuching in China. But do we need 25 ride sharing companies? Right. So one of the things that's been happening, a tremendous amount of money pouring in has been that, yes, there have been great startups trying to transform parts of the business, but there's been too much capital and therefore too much entrepreneurial activity in certain sectors. And, you know, five great robot devices is tremendous. We probably don't need 50 or 500. Right. So a lot of marginal players with questionable business models have also gotten funded, which is an exact evidence of a market that's really hot. And maybe things have gone a little too far. Uh, number three is that just the point that I mentioned that when we talk about fintech, right, you really got to tease out the differences and I would sort of urge you to understand what are the second order level of what's happening in lending versus what's happening in payments, what's happening in capital markets. Within capital markets, what's happening in the institutional side in sales and trading. We are in Boston, big asset management business, what's happening in the institutional money management industry. That's very different in the securities investment space than what's happening in the wealth management side, which is distribution of advice to retail investors like all of us. So the dynamic in each part of financial services is quite different. And I'm not gonna be able to cover all of that today, but just you know, think about that as teasing out what the differences are. Tomorrow, I'll actually walk you through what some of our thinking is in the insurance space, right? In short term. Um, I actually spent most of my career in capital markets. So I actually met some colleagues of mine who are having a hearty laugh at my expense saying, wait a second, you, you're the capital markets guy, you're gonna to talk to us about insurance tomorrow? Uh, but we're doing a lot of work in the insurance space as well, a lot of activity in that space, a lot of funding happening in that space. So tomorrow we'll talk about what's happening in insurance, but the point is just you know, financial services, broad, in, broad industry, you gotta understand what's happening within that in different subsectors. Um, taking a look at what's happening at a global level, like global fintech, um, U.S. over the last uh, 12 months, particularly first half of this year, has seems to have regained its, in its, its strong position in fintech as far as funding and investing is concerned. Right? Last year we had on the back of major fundraising in China, Asia was just on a tear. And this year things seem to be slow down. China has had both the public market side, venture capital funding going into all of an, you know, startup activity across China has declined 30% of the first two you know, first two halves of this first, first quarter of this year, or first two quarters of this year. So it's 30% over last year, right? So, so Asia seems to have come down, and therefore U.S. seems to be doing a lot better in proportion. Um, two other quick things there is that India has been a huge market attracting venture capital money. 
even though it's not about thousands of companies receiving capital, there are a few large companies. India is home to two large unicorns now. Uh, one's called uh, Paytm, the other, other one's called Policy Bazaar, it's an insurance space. And uh, for the first uh, time, India eclipsed China in terms of deal activity, which means number of deals. Uh, but uh, we, India is still about 10, 15% below what China attracted uh, in the first half of this year when it comes to venture capital funding. The other story in global fintech is Latin America seems to be attracting a tremendous amount of capital. Right? Uh, they had a massive uh, investment, $400 million single round in New Bank, which is a Brazilian bank. So Latin America, which until now was no way on the radar, or wasn't as much on the radar as Asia was, or Europe was, or the US was, last six months seems to be a big pickup in activity. Right? Most of that is actually focused in Brazil. Um, Mexico is included in Latin America. You can argue whether it fits in Latin America or not. But beyond that, Chile has a very vibrant entrepreneurial uh, sector. Um, so you know, Latin America is very concentrated across two or three countries. Um, but keep an eye on Latin America, lots of stuff happening in that space. Number five is, and I've got a whole slide on this, is um, as of uh, last week, there are about 394 unicorns. So private companies more than, both more than a billion dollars. Why you see a lot of unicorn news is that's always like canary in the gold mine, in the, in, the, in the coal mine, it's an indication of large companies achieving a certain amount of valuation, maybe on the path to going public. And if you look at companies going public at high valuations in financial services across businesses, that drives a lot of investor sentiment in the private market, right? So if Uber and Lyft, were doing extremely well. There's a knock-on effect of all kinds of private investors saying, wow, that's great that exits are happening at a tremendous valuation. Therefore, more funding and more investment. Obviously, quite the opposite seems to be happening. You've seen a lot of high-profile ideas not doing well this year. That's going to have a knock-on effect in terms of weakened investor conference in the private market. Right. So anyway, the point number um, five is that of the 394 unicorns, about 48 are uh, financial services. That's the single largest sector in a uh, single largest industry in the overall unicorn group. Uh, the U.S. has got about 28 of the 48 large unicorns, so it's still, you know, uh, dominating the list of the largest privately held fintech companies. Uh, nine unicorns out of the 48 were reached the unicorn status this year. Right. So almost 25 percent with this year, 20 percent this year. Right. That shows very clearly again a lot of flood of activity and money into larger firms, right? So you can sort of interpret that and second order level of insight there is that a lot of the large funds are going towards shoring up already successful large companies and more rounds of capital are going to the larger firms, higher amount of, amounts of money. So if you've got a hundred, you know, hundred dollars of investment going in this year, it's not going or relatively going less to small startup seed A round companies and more funds going towards larger already successful you know, large, close to a billion dollars size companies. Um, and so that's that's number five. And number six, quickly on the m and side, so you look at the private market, you either look at funding or you look at m and transactions, right? Acquisitions and mergers. On the m and side, uh, the real story there is that it used to be that private equity companies or uh, strategic companies, so, you know, large corporate firms were the major acquirers. This seems to be a broadening, a large variety of firms that are entering and making acquisitions in financial services. Case in point, in the insurance space, large carriers making a lot of big investments. In fact, last week, there was Prudential Insurance bought a company called Assurance for three and a half billion dollars. Assurance is a three-year-old startup, and uh, they never accepted any venture capital money. It was bootstrapped. Prudential wrote a check for three and a half billion dollars for that three-year-old insurance company. Now, that's an anomaly. You know, people are writing billion dollar checks easily, but there seems to be a lot of strategic acquisitions of insure tech companies, but broadly that's a trend across financial services about more variety of firms investing in, uh, in fintechs. So I've got about four more slides. I'll sort of zip through that and try to keep five minutes for, for questions. So that's kind of, in another you you have a, in words, you can understand what's happening big picture. Let me sort of share some data. So those are global uh, funds invested. Actually, sorry, this is US funds invested in, in, in FinTech. And FinTech includes insurance as well. Some people sort of don't think about insurance as, as FinTech. 
And as you can see, there was a pretty steady growth in 2014 to 17 with that you know, huge uptick in 2018, in part driven by what was happening in China, obviously behind financial deal. And again, the first half of this year, the number is about 16 billion. You analyze that, it's about 32 billion. Um, that's about a good uh, you know, third drop over last year, but still keeping in line with where things were outside of that anomaly in, in a China-based funding growth in 2018. The other thing that beyond funding that's good to look at is number of deals happening, right? So you want to see over time a healthy number of deals that are taking place. So the deal figure that you can see and the year-on-year -year percentage growth rate shows the year-on-year -year growth in number of deals, right? Now, the number of deals also includes subsequent deals done, like another fundraising round for the same company. So it could be the same firm raising three rounds of capital. That will show up as separate deals in there. Um, so, I mean, you know, it looks to be a pretty good picture, but when you look at numbers, the numbers have, you know, there's a second order level of insight and story that's behind the numbers that we tend to look at to sort of see where the money seems to be going, particularly in the private market where there's a lack of transparency, there's more opacity, uh, so it's unclear or difficult to actually judge which direction the market seems to be going. It's much easier in the public market, you can see stock prices of uh, you know, public companies listed and you can see what the health of the market is on a daily basis. So that's, that's as of last week, um, the, the 48 or so unicorns um, and uh, across six different sectors, the way we kind of define or categorize financial services, which is across capital markets uh, on the institutional side, personal finance, wealth management, lending and credit in the banking sector, uh, payments, which obviously was where a lot of this activity began in 2009 and 10. So the first order, first level of funding that went into financial services was predominantly in the lending and the payments phase. Uh, then came robot advisors, then came capital markets, and insure tech was a little bit late to the party. So you see a lot of overhang, a lot of money still coming in in the insurance space. And then institutional software solutions is kind of a catch-all. So think about that as technology and software um, that's doing, you know, across corporate functions and financial services, whether it's billing, tax, you know, accounting, all of that is an institutional software, right? Um, one of the other observations I'll sort of share is, as an analyst, when I was covering this space, I covered a lot of software companies, like software and the use of technology in finance is nothing new, right? We've been doing that. Our industry has used more technology than any other industry. What's changed over the last, this go around last 10 years or so, has been the aspirations of entrepreneurs have changed substantially after 2008 because of a combination of factors. And the aspirations are no longer to actually build software and sell it to a financial institution that then goes and services supply. It's a consumer or, a, or an enterprise. What's changed now is that a lot of these companies are bypassing the institution and directly go to the customer. You obviously see that in the B2C market a lot more vividly, but it's happening in the institutional space as well. So there was always technology and software. A lot of times people sort of scratch their heads and say, what's new about this? Like, I mean, we always use technology in finance, whether it's capital markets or in banking or whatever, right? But the difference is, and the reason why you have this debate about our fintechs going to you know, compete with incumbents is being that a lot of these venture capital or whatever funding source might be, entrepreneurs developing software and directly servicing the client, bypassing the institution and competing directly with the institution. So that's, that's kind of important uh, thing, thing to note. Uh, the other thing you can say, observation you can take from here is that there's no clear pattern. It's not like if you look at the 48 unicorns worldwide, they are dominated in one particular vertical, right? I mean, here for, for convenience, we actually did about 45 firms here, not all 48 are on this list, but they seem to be very neatly divided across eight to every category. Uh, that's just to make it look, you know, pleasing. But uh, it's fairly sort of divided up across all of financial services. It's not like payment seems to be creating the most unicorns. In fact, insurance, like I said, which came late to the party, has actually caught up a lot. And there have been almost three or four insurance private companies that have reached a unicorn status in the last 12 to 18 months of all. Many of them are actually outside the U.S. So that's what's happening in terms of, you know, the unicorn list. By the way, any questions, observations, Please, happy to you know, answer them. Should we have people on the phone as well, right? Do they have yes, the ability sir, to ask? No. Okay. So, um, 
any any comments, observations, anything? Everybody still awake? Yes, sir. So uh, I see circle. Yep. Uh, let's, can you comment on the recent events relative to circle? If you wouldn't mind, let's just take it take that one offline. Love to talk about that. Obviously, Jeremy Allaire, local Boston-based company, is a great success story for us. Happy to talk about that. You know, offline and individual companies. Um, this is actually something that, you know, a good piece of analysis that um, our, our associates put together. And this is where I, I was sort of describing where you got to sort of break up financial services into the different industry verticals and see sort of what's happening. So let me sort of walk you through, because there's a lot on this chart. You don't have to remember it, but then I'll sort of point you out to what the most important issues are. So six sectors, the way we defined them on the previous slide, and there are three data points that are mapped out here, right? One of the X and Y axis, and then the size of the bubbles to know the third variant that you're uh, collecting. So the X axis is the median capital raise, right? Which means if you add up all the companies in a particular sector, say it's capital markets, and you, let's say there are 500 companies that raise capital. And in this case, we're looking at um, last year and a half worth of data to make it manageable, right? And obviously there's a, you wanna look at what recent deals are rather than looking at 2014 deals. So it includes all deals in calendar year 2018 and through June 30th of 2019, right? So if you look at all of those deals in, in each vertical, the median amount of capital raised is what's on the x-axis, right? On the y-axis is the median valuation, which means again, if there are 100 companies, keeping outliers aside, what's the app, what's the company in the middle, what the valuation is. And so what you want to do there is look at across sectors, where are valuations the highest? Right. And that's important for all matters, whether it's the health of that particular sector, the investment potential, where funds want to be going in, where exits might happen, if the median valuation tends to be higher, obviously attracts more investor interest. There's probably more activity happening in that sector and there's more exits potentially that might happen in that, in that area. And then the third dimension is the size of the bubbles themselves. And note the total amount of capital raised, um, capital invested in that sector. So right off the bat with those three parameters, you can see that when it comes to median capital raise and median valuations, they seem to be a quite a broad spread, right? You've got capital markets, which is again, as we define it, institutional side of the greatest securities investments industry, so sales and trading, anything that, um, you know, the, the trade life cycle on the institutional side, any software in that space is within capital markets. Separate again from personal finance and wealth management, so all the robot advisor stuff you hear about, that's personal finance best management. So you can see the capital markets, the median capital raise and the median valuations, free money tend to be sort of on the lower end. And then you've got on the extreme right end, payments, which not only is payments the second largest uh, amount, of, actually third largest amount of capital raised in aggregate last year and a half, but payments tends to have a much higher amount of capital raise and median valuation on a median basis, right? Uh, the other sort of clarification with those that might be interested is that we've actually excluded all deals less than $5 million, right? So the reality is there's, there's a tremendous amount of deals that happen that are angel round or you know, pre-series A round that are small, like you know, under a million dollars or between one and five million dollars. If you add up all those deals, it creates a lot of noise and creates a downward bias on the median capital raise median valuation. So a common element or a common form of analysis is to strip out those really small companies and look at series A through series D round. So again, the observations I would take there is one, how the different sectors have been performing across that area, right? Or where funds seem to be going. So performance is actually not the right metric, but where funding seems to be happening and how the market tends to be valuing those companies. I'm not saying market, I mean, this is obviously private transactions, right? So the valuations are whatever another investor tends to raise capital and say, is this is what value I call for this. Uh, there's a fair amount of, you know, range in that space. Not a, on a, you know, on a percentage basis, it might seem high, but the median amount of capital raised for capital markets was 12 million, payments was $20 million, right? So in percentage terms, it seems really high, but it's $8 million difference, right? So a lot of variety in terms of where funds seem to be going and how private investors are valuing the companies while doing a funding, funding round. 
Sure, yeah, because absolutely, yeah, please. So uh, one of the important things to note is the difference between the sectors and how the funding has evolved. Um, if you see the, the top right corner versus the bottom left corner, kind of the, the capital markets versus personal finance and stuff, you can see that B2C sector has traditionally over the past few years, because of involvement of VCs that are much more familiar with investing in B2C companies, have really made that as a priority and has a lot, lot more funding has gone into B2C businesses than B2B businesses, which is what traditional capital markets and lending businesses are. Not that that doesn't mean necessarily that they are valued less or there's less interest. It's just that those sectors hopefully will ca catch up as time passes and more funding goes into the B2B side of the equation. So it's just that the dynamics of where the money has gone in versus where the opportunity might lie. So InsureTech, for example, uh, is transforming right now and is actually rapidly going through. That bubble was very, very small a couple of years ago, would have been even below capital markets. Now it's already kind of surpassed capital markets and it's moving up quickly. So it's just the cycles in which investments happen, and that's kind of really what is one of the important points on this. Great, no, thank you, because that's an important point, obviously. And something, one of the things we're sort of examining is, so if the first wave of funding for the first 10 years tend to be more towards consumer-oriented businesses, is the B2B stuff, so you know more enterprise-focused um, startups and financial services, is that gonna be, is more money gonna be pouring in that space? And it is. Um, you know, and um, because obviously they are inherent factors that drive consumer businesses easier to kind of scale at times, tougher to scale institutional business, at least on the top line, it's easier to show, uh, you know, growth in terms of, you know, number of consumer uh, acquisition versus uh, enterprise customers, right? So no, thank you, because that's a good point. I missed mentioning that. And then on, this is, uh, Another view, so again, we've been talking about median capital raised. This time, it's all financial services, all of those sectors put together. And uh, what we sort of, the idea of this analysis is to show you the median capital raised and the median valuation across the funding life cycle. So if you look at the rounds of funding, whether it's from seed, seed round, series A, B, C, and D, and we have said excluded, you know, there used to be a lot of E rounds and F rounds these days, right after D, either you do multiple D rounds or a company goes public. But if you look at bulk of the transactions between series A and B, across those rounds, uh, what's the amount of median capital raised in terms of absolute amount of dollars raised and the median valuation ascribed uh, to those rounds of capital. Now, some of the stuff is fairly intuitive, like for example, median valuation. As a company grows in size, you'd expect the valuation to hopefully you know, increase. Now, there are a lot of series A round companies that got funded, then went shut down shop and closed out, and therefore they never reached a B, C, or D round. So naturally, there is a survivorship bias in the numbers at the bottom, that only the ones that survive make it to the B, C, and D round, and therefore you would expect upward bias in median valuations. And you'll obviously see that, that between a series A and B round, you know, the average valuation goes up from 28 million to 25 million, and, and a series D round, 460 million, which is obviously Seems high, but a lot of that is um, pushed up by unicorns that obviously have that have raised the series D round. But taking out, stripping out the, the unicorns, um, it's still the $350 million number you can see in the right bar shows excluding unicorns where the median valuation is for a series D round. So this seems to be a fairly uh, good uptick or a multiple as firms go from a series B to a series D round. And the median capital raise side, uh, the number there is you don't look at a multiple as much, even though we've marked that. The idea there is to actually look at how much fund is, funds are being raised, what the median capital amount is raised at a particular series uh, round. Right? So at an average series A round is $10 million, series E round is $58 million. The other, other thing that we don't have uh, the numbers on it in this analysis is you always want to look at in a particular sector, whether it's insurance or capital markets or payments or lending, where is much of the deal activity? Is it at a series A round or is it at a series B, C, or D round? The reason why that's important is shows you know, the pipeline of new entrepreneurs that are coming in and solving problems in a particular sector. 
And if you see, see the more mature sectors like payments and lending, the startup series A round of funding seems to be slowing down pretty dramatically, right? So more money is being chased to do a series C or D round and less money or less entrepreneurs that are trying to solve or create the next strike or square. Whereas if you look at insurance, there seems to be pretty healthy series A round of funds, firms that are still coming in. So entrepreneurs are still saying, in insurance, we still hope to be able to make a difference. Whereas in other mature areas like lending and payments, fewer, there are no Jack Dorsey's today that are waking up and saying, I want to append the payment infrastructure. Right. So more mature businesses, much of the funds go towards later stage funding. Less mature sectors right now from a funding standpoint, like insurance, lots of startup activity still on the Series A round. That's very important because more Series A early round activity means that's the deal flow that's going to basically serve the entire market beyond, right? Because Series A is going to lead to B, C, and D, hopefully an exit. So that deal flow is extremely important. Think about Series A rounds. I'll come to your question in a second, sir. Series A round, think of that as the number of companies going public in the public market, right? So the less IPOs, the less capital being deployed, less trading, Secondary market all depends upon the number of IPO deals. Right. Yes, sir. Are the sectors mature or are the ideas mature? Right. So the the, I, the example you just gave, yeah. there, right, is you know some of the sectors people are giving up, right? And and, and is are they giving up because there's no more good ideas in that in that sector? Or I don't know if that's what you're saying or not. Just yeah. To... The, so. That's not what I was saying, but I mean you're hitting the point. That's that's the right right question you're asking. Um, I think it's because the easy problems in those sectors have been addressed. The tougher problems, it's not like payments and lending, we fix that issue. But there are deep issues in lending, for example, and credit. But startup fund or venture capital funded startups are probably not the best candidates to solve those problems. Right? Secondarily, investors are no longer willing or less willing on a relative basis to allocate capital to sectors like payments and lending compared to where they were six to eight years ago. So I think it's a combination of both issues. Because anything you want to? No, I think that's a very valid point. Uh, there are certain areas like payments and lending, for example, in lending particularly, they're, uh, they're easy uh, flowing, flowing through through fruits are already sort of plucked in terms of digitizing the process and getting it the loans to the consumer within 48 hours as opposed to, to uh, weeks and months it used to take. That the easy digitization process is already done. But the harder part, which is now going through making sure that the um, your KYC AML, where you're not breaching the thing, where you're, you are not pumping, us, uh, pumping, pumping against the CFTC uh, rules and regulations, where some of these startups were never thought of, they were always started up as a technology company, not as a financial institution. So they are much less aware of the regulation side. So as that, they've become, they have come under the purview and some of the debacles happened with Lending Club, for example, which was a massive blow up for the industry. And that when there's a blow up like that, the VC community pulls back dramatically. So the, the question you're asking is whether the, Sectors mature or certain ideas aren't there. Ideas are always there. It's just the question of, are you targeting a different segment or different product? And um, are you doing it within the realms of the, uh, uh, of the regulations? That's really, if you, there are plenty of new startups still happening. It's just that the VC money becomes a lot more expensive at that point to plug, put in, uh, in a new startup. Something, you have to have something much more dramatically different than what's out there in the market already. Right. Yeah. So that's, I think Sri is saying that we've taken five, seven minutes more than I was allocated. Right. So I, I'm just kind of losing track of time with all the insights I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the idea was just to sort of kick off the Quant University for the next four days. And uh, you guys have a tr uh, tremendous amount of time. I mean, rolling up your sleeves and helping solve some of these problems, right? And we'd love to hear if you've got some ideas for companies we can fund and now or in the future. But thank you for your time and we'll be around today. And obviously I'll be back tomorrow to talk about insurance. Thanks a lot. One question. Sure. Any one or two questions? Okay.
So thanks so much to you. No this problem. was excellent. And uh, thank you, Vikas, for uh, chiming in. Um, so next time, we'll probably extend the duration of the, the boot camps so that we can kind of bring in more speakers. Uh, so the first session you heard was more from a funding perspective and getting a landscape of you know, what's actually happening in the industry. Uh, so uh, the next couple of sessions are going to be more focusing on the business model side of things. Right? So how many of you are active fintech uh, well, uh, professionals, like you know, people working in the fintech industry? Okay, a couple of you. How many of you are, you know, in traditional financial services industries? There's no traditional anymore, but in the financial services industry, the mainstream financial industry, and you are planning to do you know, maybe a project in FinTech or your company is planning to do something in FinTech and you're kind of orienting yourselves to get into that group. Okay, uh, good distribution. How many of you are students? My favorite group. Okay, great. Uh, you guys, I presume, are planning to get into the financial services industry or the FinTech industry, or you already have an idea in mind and you're looking for investors like me, you know, uh, right, checks. Uh, and you should network more. I know there are a lot of uh, opportunities to network uh, in these next four days. And uh, how many of you are people who are in the technology industry trying to get into the tech? Okay. How many of you are financial professionals trying to get an understanding of the technology side of things? Okay, a couple of you. So it looks like a good distribution. Uh, so the next uh, couple of sessions, we're going to primarily focus on the business model side of things rather than just the funding aspect. Because we're, when we're kind of planning out these sessions, we looked at the, the distribution of all the topics which were out there. And we have a lot of investors coming in and uh, pitching various uh, you know, uh, insights on work, what's actually happening. And uh, you also have a lot of entrepreneurs kind of sharing their journeys on how they have got into FinTech and how they have made uh, their mark. Now, for someone who's trying to get into the fintech industry, trying to understand from a big picture perspective what all of these actually mean, so you want to kind of step back a little bit and look at it more from a uh, from a research perspective on what's the differentiator, right? Because this is not an established science wherein you have a stream and everybody has a path to take. If you are, let's say, planning to start, uh, you know, a bakery, so it's more or less clear on what you need to do. You know, you need to kind of survey, you know, the, the, the area you're going to be focused on, what's your core competence, and how do you make work out there. FinTech is a very interesting piece because you have a lot of interesting ideas. You have a lot of drivers in the market, and you are trying to kind of come up with these ideas, and probably 90% of those ideas are not going to be successful. So we want to kind of take a more rigorous approach. And obviously when we do the, the we actually have an eight week program on FinTech and we're going to kind of take each one of these teams and take a very rigorous approach. And I want to give you some samplers for each one of these teams, just to get your you know, uh, thoughts going and how do you actually assess some of these ideas. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to tell you is a little bit of a story. And uh, anybody trading muni bonds, like have traded muni bonds before? Okay, so that was my first uh, project when I was uh, at Citigroup, and this was uh, uh, more than 15 years ago. And at Citigroup, we were primarily uh, you know, basically trading uni bonds, and we were coming up with technologies and a technology based uh, approach to facilitate trading of these uni bonds. Uh, now, the thing to kind of understand is you know, these are very illiquid. And uh, the market is very scattered. You, know, you don't have like a E-Trade or uh, you know, the Charles Schwab where you can go in and say, I want to buy 15 uh, of these and 20 of these and buy these options. You can't do these types of things. So these assets, you'll have to kind of you know, plan it out. And many a times, uh, people just use the traditional channel, which is the phone, to call another person and say, I want to be able to trade these bonds and how much are you going to code? So we were basically creating a system at that point. And uh, this point was what was called as a community bit wanted system. It was basically an auction-based methodology. And on the left side, you see various players who are either planning to buy or sell muni bonds. And the goal was to basically create a channel 
through which if you wanted to sell or buy any of these assets, you post it as a bid warranted. You have a specific time frame, and then people are going to bid on it. And what used to happen is based on the best bid, you're going to you know post the transaction. Usually, there will be a 30 minute 30 minute window. So you post the bond, you have 30 minutes, and after 30 minutes, you look at all the the bids and the best price gets the gets the transaction. Now, when we were at City, uh, what our goal was, we had a lot of traders and who had discretionary you know, amounts they could, they could trade on. But you also had the city uh, institution, which was also holding and also transacting these assets. And one of the thoughts was, instead of individual traders putting out their bids, and then you see like there are a lot of bids from city, so maybe city is interested. So the price of these bonds may go up. If there's someone who's trading, may just put in like five bonds, and have 50,000 bonds they want to sell. They're just checking out whether there's interest in these bonds and who's going to be interested and how much are they ready to pay. So the goal for creating this system, the newly big one system on the city group end was basically create an internal auction within city. I was involved in the project and get all these bits from these traders and then get the best price out there, whether it could be system driven or by traders, and then send out the best price to the street. So you could see only one price on the street rather than uh, you know, seeing multiple bids for the city on the street. The reason why I'm mentioning this is, uh, you know, we are looking at investments and trading as the first theme for today. And these are things which are not really novel. I mean, like, you know, we have been doing things, you know, you know addressing specific problems at a B2B level for a really long time now. Leveraging technology, and we had to create a real-time system, we had to create you know, a queuing mechanism. You know, I come from a technology perspective, so I kind of look at like you know, what the various challenges you need to go through when you're designing some of these kinds of systems. And you have to build out the, uh, the, the scalability, the, you know, the robustness, the redundancy, the disaster recovery systems, and have the transactions go through in order to make these happen. And when Vikas and uh, Dee were mentioning about aspects about just technology companies coming into the market and then trying to make their mark, it's not as easy as other areas. You know, because there appears to be a lot of regulation involved, and there's a lot of context involved in financial services. And if you don't understand the markets really well, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to make the mark. So uh, we're going to uh, kind of look at some of the key themes out there. Um, so. One of the things to notice, uh, and I've given you a bunch of links, and all these slides are available on the on the web page, uh, so you can go and uh, download these slides. We'll, we'll we'll actually post it on a different platform in a bit, but but today, because a couple of people are already uh, asking for these slides, so I just thought we'd make it available on the, on the web page. Uh, so you need to kind of understand two things. One is uh, it's a variety of innovative business models. It's not just about you know various people kind of you know. Uh, uh, bringing these products into markets, innovative business models. There's been a whole transformation in how things are done. And there's leveraging of all these emerging technologies which are there, which is basically what FinTech is. A couple of themes you're going to look at when you start looking at these opportunities. Now, one of the things I you know, ask my students to do when they're talking about FinTech is, you know, when you look at a company, just don't, go, uh, you know, just don't be excited about you know, what they're doing and how much funding they're getting and uh, how they are actually making a mark in the, in the industry. Kind of understand their business model. Now, what are they actually doing differently? Why is someone else not able to copy that particular methodology? Now, what is their strategy behind you know, going into a business there? And what was the opportunity out there? And do a traditional business analysis to understand their business model to see whether it's going to be a sustainable model. When we look at all these large scale acquisitions by larger companies, you have to kind of understand so why isn't this company able to replicate this particular model, right? So that's something you have to understand. So some of the themes you're gonna look at is there's gonna be automation in various ways. Um, there are not to be named uh, insurance company in New York. Um, you know, um, when I teach at Northeastern, uh, I teach uh, machine learning and data science class. And I was also you know, kind of uh, asking my students like, you know, where do they go for their internships and forms? And they basically said that uh, you know, in one particular uh, cohort, eight to 10 students all got internships and co-ops in this one organization in New York. And they were all you know, being supported 
by the labs component of the SMART organization. And their goal was to basically bring in new talent and new blood to just basically create a very innovative startup-like environment so that they create these innovative solutions from there. And primarily, the whole goal was automation of some of the manually done things within that particular enterprise. And it's not completely rolled out yet, but their big picture idea is, you know, there is so much automation we could potentially be doing. And rather than coming top down saying, okay, our five-year five goal is to basically, you know, change customer service and basically build this whole thing out, they are basically taking it, you know, in a, in a startup mode and then kind of building it the whole thing out. And when they throw out the capabilities, they're going to deploy it using the things. And then there's unbundling. That's traditionally, you know, when you know we think about a bank or a financial uh, organization, we have been looking at all these products being serviced by this large entity. Now you're seeing a lot of unbundling happening. A couple of uh, themes you're going to look at, you know, equity crowdsourcing platforms, uh, peer-to-peer implementing uh, platforms, uh, robo-advisors. Anybody using robo-advisors in our investments? No one wants to say yes. If you have it installed, I know that. We will check the the credentials. Um, anyways, um, you know, a lot of brokerage services. So these are some of the examples which are there in the context of business models. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, you have to kind of understand you know, why we are talking about all these things. You know, it's not just about technology use, being used in finance. So we are at this confluence of various scenarios which has happened in the last five to ten years or so, which is making this kind of a, a flourishing ground for these innovations to happen. Uh, the first thing to understand is, you know, uh, post-financial crisis. Obviously, the traditional. Uh, how many of you were in the post-financial crisis and you were? in the financial industry at that time. So you remember those days, right? You know, in terms of budgets and how technology spending was and how, you know, uh, departments were cut out. And, uh, you know, at that point in time, you know, I was uh, starting my, uh, you know, my mantles uh, role as uh, financial engineering uh, uh, team lead. And at that point, I was kind of realizing how difficult companies were, you know, uh, trying to optimize their infrastructure and look at innovative ways of doing things. Uh, so that was one of the major drivers. You know, that was an opportunity where a lot of technology companies and a lot of other companies kind of came up with mechanisms uh, to help uh, build out this revolution. And then secondly, uh, the generational shift. You know, uh, uh, you know that the medium through which content is consumed, the medium through which interactions are done today is not traditional. Uh, of course, there's been more mature research and uh, I'll actually post in tomorrow's session, one uh, of the studies, uh, the OTR network, and uh, I think it was uh, Oliver Wyman, uh, this guy's something on a really good paper to talk about uh, some key aspects about how is it different when you know, we talk about the millennials and the and Gen Z's kind of using financial products, how is it different, not just a generational shift, but also, you know, there are things which you have to kind of understand because, you know, financial app is not the same as another social media app. I check my WhatsApp, my Facebook, and LinkedIn multiple times, but I don't go to my financial app multiple times. So there's a frequency change. You know, you're not having the same kind of an engaged mode. Uh, but there are a lot of other things you have to kind of factor in to uh, you know, cater to this generation. Uh, but obviously, you know, uh, there's been a lot of change in terms of thought process. On, you know, what does it mean for saving? What does it mean for long-term uh, commitment to certain uh, kind of goals and things like that? And uh, technology is a major driver, obviously. Uh, you know, uh, uh, University is a part of the NVIDIA AI accelerator. We use our GPUs for calculations. And it's just fascinating the amount of compute power we have uh, for the cost we are actually paying now. You know, 10 years ago, when we, went, we were kind of you know, engaged in projects to do things like you know, simulations, you know, when someone says, we're gonna forecast your portfolio, uh, it's not just going to be a magic model which basically says, okay, here is this point estimate of what your portfolio is going to look five years from now, right? So you have to basically create a model and do exhaustive stress testing, kind of back test the whole thing, and then you have to use a lot of compute power to do all these things. And today, it's feasible with the amount of technology you have there, and that's making the whole thing possible. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, many of the things which was not accessible. You know, the traditional financial companies, maybe you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted a particular service from a large asset uh, a company, you would go in there and they would basically say, well, we have these tiers. If you don't meet these gold, silver, bronze tiers, you know, we won't be able to offer you these services. 
right? And many a times you would just come back saying, okay, this institution has not been on for this particular service to me, but now you're seeing all these products kind of you know, accessible at your fingertips and uh, uh, you know, there's increasing disintermediation in that. So some of these drivers which are affecting it. Okay, so uh, we actually have eight themes and I'm just gonna give you a snapshot and uh, in the future sessions, we'll kind of cover some of these themes. Uh, but we kind of you know bucket fintech into these you know payments, blockchain, trading investments, planning, lending, insurance, big data analytics, and security. It's kind of surprised that you know we didn't have any security related sessions in the next four days, but uh, uh, that's a very important theme too. Okay, so uh, theme for today: trading and investments. Uh, you want to kind of uh, so again the uh, this uh, research paper actually for people who are. Uh, relatively new with fintech and kind of wanting to understand the various business models out there. Uh, it's a really nice paper. You know, some of the things you want to kind of look at is, you know, if you are basically taking different applications, you want to bucket them as, you know, what's it used for? You know, is it an information uh, system for assisting decision support or decision, it's a decision support system? So it could be things like, you know, comparison websites, you know, uh, for networking, for setting up classes and things like that. Or if you are an institution and you are looking at uh, daily investment management, you, know, you want to look at some kind of a financial aggregate platform, or it could be things which are, could be in mobile or automated, like mobile advisors or social trading platforms. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you are looking at you know comparison websites, uh, you want to kind of understand you know, what's the business model. Right? You know, it's pretty easy to create these because what these companies are mostly doing is primarily collecting metadata. For these products which are out there. And then a company may offer a particular service, and you basically build out a metadata of what the service is about, what's the class of this particular service, the various attributes of the service. Think of it as a search problem. You know, if you're looking at, let's say, go to Home Depot and you're searching for a particular product, right? You have various ways in which you could search the product. You, know, you can search it by price, you can search it by brand, you can search it by uh, various attributes of your particular product. And the reason why you're able to find it so easily and not have to go to Home Depot and walk through all these aisles is because the rich metadata of these products are available, right? And guess what? We are seeing that amount of richness through these financial products. You know, things which traditionally had to be done through financial advisors in the past, because first of all, you were not educated about these products. There was not much information out there available well, out there online. And you had to go in and talk to people who had this information about specific products. Now you have you know, aggregator platforms, which are basically collecting all the metadata and making it easily available and searchable through easily accessible interfaces. That's enabling them to provide you. And why are they creating those interfaces and services for you? They have a business model and uh, you know, some of this is available. You know, when you click there, there's either a referral or a company is actually paying a fee if you kind of you know, come into and buying those products uh, through those interfaces. And it gives you those products where you can search and compare and contrast and see what actually meets your needs at a very level. And then Mint is another website, this is kind of a screenshot. Uh, it basically helps you aggregate, you know, it gives you like a 360 degree view of your entire you know, investment uh, you know, uh, portfolio, if you will. Uh, so you can like, you know, combine your checking, savings, credit card, brokerage, et cetera, et cetera. You can kind of you know, uh, look at various products which are out there or also see which actually meets your specific needs. <coughs> okay, and then uh, robo-advisors, I'm gonna spend a little more time on this uh, on uh, day four, but uh, so here you have an option to basically leverage based on your investment philosophy, your risk appetite, you can choose various products and you can kind of you know, determine like what products are best for you. And, uh, and I mean, this, uh, I'll show you some more research in this particular area. But again, these are some of these are estimates on value. If you're planning a particular kind of retirement, so where are you in that whole spectrum and how much do you need to do in order to get there? Now, um, <clears throat> some of these products, I mean, you know, when I look at some of these themes, you know, many a times I look at, you know, when I was uh, fresh out of business school, and I was kind of interviewing with companies, some of the larger asset managers, and some of the larger brokerages actually had these kinds of products embedded in their websites. It was hard to access and it was not very functional. And most of the times it was just an afterthought to just basically say, okay, we do have a tool available which will help you forecast your retirement plan and it's made available. It's a Java applet, which may not work on many platforms, but it's there 
And if you put in sufficient time and effort, you're going to get an estimate. And many a times you would not believe it that you just kind of live it at that. Okay? And nowadays there's been a lot of time which is making it accessible. And uh, you know, the, the pendulum has kind of shifted on the other side uh, nowadays, unfortunately, in various ways because you have a lot of very cool interfaces and you can get a lot of insights, but many a times we don't know whether those insights are actually a rigorous setup behind the scenes. Uh, because many times you just kind of get very jazzy graphics on a lot of interesting things, but you know, there may not be much science behind the scenes which are actually generating these insights. So uh, it's a cautionary note to basically look at uh, you know, how these products are actually working. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, integration of alternative data out there. You know, as communication has changed, and you know, how many of you have a Twitter account? Most of you have Twitter accounts, so if you don't have one, you should get one, at least to just follow the news. It's a free source of information. Um, but uh, the point is, you know, a lot of uh, important bits of information is coming through social media, social media channels. And tomorrow we're going to discuss one specific case study uh, for Tesla for you know, that particular aspect. Uh, but that is also influencing how people are making decisions and a lot of uh, you know, uh, parties being put into uh, leveraging these alternate data sources for making decisions. Okay, um, and then uh, there are a bunch of uh, uh, you know, interesting, I would say, and innovative business models. Uh, you know, there's a uh, the part that people don't voluntarily plan for big purchases or voluntarily plan for you know, savings or paying off their loans and things like that. So if you make it involuntary by you know, rounding off every transaction, so instead of paying you know, 275 for a cup of coffee, they round off for three dollars every time, and the twenty-five cents goes towards a particular budget or pays off, you know, a bunch of amount going towards your loan. It becomes easy for me to track, and I'm not, you know, every time I have a cup of coffee, I get this you know, good feel that I'm also paying back a little bit of my student loan. So it's worth the, you know, it's worth that cup of coffee. You know. uh, but the point is, you know, that some of these interesting business models are enabling you to kind of you know, get into that routine and discipline which you may not have uh, voluntarily. <clears throat> okay, so um, the advice, investment advice value chain, you know, that's, that's again uh, another area where there's a lot of innovation happening. You know, things like, uh, you know, customer profiling, you know, understanding who your customer is, and understanding the needs of customization. So uh, personalization is gonna be very important in the future because you have a lot of me too products out there. Right? So it's not just the brand anymore. You don't trust a particular entity and go into the entity. You're basically seeing commoditization of various products out there. So you have to think about like, what's the value you're going to provide? And the more personal you can get and understand the needs of your customers, those solutions are going to get uh, better, uh, uh, better coverage. And then asset allocation, like, you know, depending on you know, what kind of assets you were traditionally investing in. As you know, how many of you own Bitcoin in your portfolio? A couple of you are honest. <laughs> so, but yeah, you know, you have Bitcoin and a bunch of other uh, things out there. And then uh, trade execution, you know, uh, it's not uh, 2005, 2004 anymore, but you place to trade and you have to wait for confirmation. Uh, you get fast execution through your mobile devices, portfolio rebalancing, tax loss harvesting, portfolio analysis. All these are traditional themes in the investment advice spectrum, if you will, where traditional uh, financial advisors were you know, primarily uh, providing you those individual services, but you now have products which are enabling uh, those uh, in a much more accessible way. On the other hand, a uh, couple of, uh, you know, cautionary notes, if you will, you know, uh, this was a report put out by FINRA, uh, looking at the digital advice report, and, uh, you know, if you look at a uh, 27 year old investing in retirement and September, you know, September 2015, each digital advisor gave different portfolio recommendations for the same person. And they basically did a study and you know, you had like, you know, and they haven't specifically named these advisors, you know, but you have like various advisors. And if you look at the equity, fixed income and other, which involves real estate, currencies, uh, precious metals, commodities, et cetera, 
you can see that, you know, uh, for example, Digital Advisor A was given 42% domestic, Digital Advisor C was given 26% for the same person, right? So you don't have a common methodology on what does risk actually mean for a particular person. So if you are looking at you know, a financial advisor who's been trained, you know, I'm a CFA charter holder myself, and he was already a CFA charter holder. So when you go through this rigorous curriculum of you know, how do you look at asset management and then kind of understand uh, the needs of your uh, clientele and have the fiduciary responsibility. But many of these technology-driven decisions for banks, uh, you have to kind of you know, understand that you know, we don't know what models are being used to kind of generate these kinds of what? So something the industry hasn't really caught up yet. So there's going to be a lot of uh, regulatory aspects in the context of understanding and validating some of these model aspects or how you're going to be you know, making these kind of suggestions. Um, on the other hand, um, you know the profiling aspects of you know how do you actually create your advice to a customer? Many a times when it comes from a technology company, they always focus on ease and kind of always be closing, right? So you want to kind of get them to open the account, put in your first check and get them going. It's always the methodology of the design of the application rather than stepping back and kind of, let me understand the big picture. Let me sit with you for another hour. Kind of understand your, you know, what is your investment philosophy? How are you going to be making decisions? What are your life events? When are you going to be retiring? What are the education plans you have? Marriage? What are the milestones you are planning for? How do we kind of, you know, create that investment policy for you? Is not typically the methodology a lot of companies take. So you predominantly get a, a canned questionnaire, if you will, and those questionnaires and the answers to those questionnaires basically determine the asset recommendations for you. So some of these things, you know, it's ripe for innovation, you know, the whole profiling aspects of how do you basically look at a customer and understand their specific needs and provide specific advice for them. So you can see that if you look at, um, you know, uh, one of them uh, saying, I'm saving in this account because I want to prepare for retirement. I'm saving for a major upcoming expense. I'm saving for something special, vacation, car, et cetera, rainy day funds, retired, long-term wealth. If that's my first question, for people who understand computer science and look at the you know, decision trees and branching, how can you accommodate all your possible philosophies and kind of drive your first question that there's probably a decision tree that's kind of branching out with if-then rules to kind of get you to where you have to be as for this particular tool. So that again is you know, machine learning and other tools are actually helping that by leveraging the decisions made by humans and bringing those and formalizing those as models, which can be incorporated as part of digital advice packages. Uh, but that's something you know, is again, still not completely validated out there. It's still very right for innovation. So yeah, I just thought this was a very funny question here myself. You know, if at the end of it, I had to come up with a portfolio issue, I don't think I'd be able to. But six to 10 questions, they always like, you know, put in a bunch of UX designers in the room and say, okay, here's your interface. This is the real estate you can have. You don't want to bore the customer by more than eight questions. This is the number of choices you can go with. Get me a product and we'll validate it. Do some UX testing, A-B testing and roll out the product. Um, still ripe for innovation, very ripe for innovation. Okay, so um, I know we are running a little bit late today. Uh, how many of you have a hard stop at one o'clock? Okay, a couple of you. Um, so we may go like 10 minutes-ish, uh, past one. I'll stop here for a second if there are any specific questions. Uh, we'll also be there after the session in case there are any other questions. Yeah, one, uh, we'll take one or two, and then we'll kind of uh, hold it off to that for a second. Yeah, you have a question to me? Um, yeah, on the, um, the example that you provided on the going to get a cup of coffee, yeah. and it's, how does that exactly work? Like say I'm going to, uh, I don't know, this, whatever coffee shop and coffee's three dollars right. and I want 25 cents to go to okay. whatever to pay off my student loan. How does that exactly work? Are you still paying the store 275? Yeah, 25 cents on back. Yeah. So they're basically yeah. facilitating the payments. They become a payment a payment facilitator. So you authorize a three dollar transaction. So when you go and pay for coffee, you're paying it through this app and the app channels 275 to the coffee shop and puts 25 cents onto your account. And then on a periodic basis, every month at the end of the month, 
They give you hurrah, you save three hundred and uh, you put in thirty two dollars towards your student payment. Got it. And I'm assuming that you could change those preferences. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. You know, you can say you know you can round it up to the next dollar or the next ten dollars or whatever it is. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah, the, uh, the RoboAdvisor slide where it talked about the six different companies and they all had different allocations. Is there anything inherently wrong with that? Because I'm thinking about if I sat down with six different financial yeah. advisors who had a rigorous process, right. I could probably get six different allocations. Right. Anyway. Um, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good observation. I mean, um, think about it this way, right? So if uh, you are, you know, I don't know, 27-year-old person, just started with the job kind of a thing. So overall, if you think about your risk profile, with your you know, amount of earning you may have versus you know, the amount of risk you are able to take kind of a thing, at no point in time, if you are going with a mutual fund strategy or media strategy of some sort, right? So you have some like expected returns of these assets and you are ready to take up some amount of risk, right? So at that point, Typically, you may get certain kinds of distributions, more oriented towards domestic or towards, you know, international or whatever it is. To see so much deviation, right, is one of the things you may want to factor in. Like, you know, what was actually used? If these models are transparent, then you can compare and contrast, saying, you know, what we are getting at more or less the same results at the end. The distribution may be different. But a human, so if you're kind of, you know, they will understand not just the context of the risk of these assets, but they'll also have a context of the economy, they'll have a context of the milestones the person wants to achieve. They would be a lot more thoughtful then rather than just just the description of the portfolios. Okay, yes, please. Last even, question. Even, yeah, yeah. Even, but even in that, I want to follow up on this, even in that situation uh, where, you, where you speak of a live advisor. Sure. Behind him is his firm's background. Right. So you may tell a lot of interesting, you may, you know, my brother in law, blah, blah, blah. Right. That doesn't make it into his background. Well, so in theory, right. In theory, those things should all be the same. In fact, if you talk to a live person, right. they should all be the same. And yet you've got like that one. Yeah. So somebody, was, somebody, that, again, somebody that's, was telling that's the 27 year old applicant. Well, they should put 40% in fixed. Right. Well, that's, that's absolutely true, right? Because, you know, uh, frankly, you know, I wasn't thinking about fixed income for a long time till I was at Citigroup and I was doing muni. So I was like, okay, all these options are available. I've not even thought about it. But um, the reason why people go into mutual funds is because of that reason, right? Because, you know, you don't know the reason why passive is kind of taking off and people are taking it into this is very I don't know to look at particular assets, but I'm going to look at uh, you know, my expected returns that go into this particular uh, set of products. But again, that's one of the reasons why these products are getting popular because the skeptics and, you know, you don't traditionally believe like, well, what does my financial advisor know? And there is a motivation why they're providing these services in the first place. So that's one of the reasons why I'm not saying that these products are bad. I'm just saying that it's right for innovation. You're not there yet. You're just starting with creating these yeah. products, yeah. and there's a lot more thought and you know, thing which could be put in to make these products much more mature and also validate, like you know, like, you know, who's going to benchmark these products and how can you hold these companies responsible for the advice they gave, and how many of those advices are actually you know, things which someone's going to rely on for till they retire. Okay. Uh, one last question. We need sure. Just to follow up on both of those comments. Um, I think something that we haven't brought up that's really relevant is that it's a, there's a significant difference between uh, how regulators treat people and how regulators treat technology. Right. So a regulator looking at a firm with a bunch of people giving right. different breakdowns is going to regulate it differently right. from a technology company or a fintech company that, is, that has algorithms, algorithms that are built to be more streamlined. Right. That's true. And again, that whole notion of you know, attribution comes into play, right? You know, how do you attribute to a particular person or an organization and when it comes to like, you know, a technology product, and you know, I was talking to one of my uh, clients and you know, they were saying, you know, sometimes technology is used to just validate human decisions. And they choose the technology products which actually matches their thought process. 
right? And at that point, you know, what, what does it mean if you're basically saying, well, it's a model which gave the decision, but I built the model and I put in all the constraints so that it basically reflects my decision in place, right? Uh, all these are very valid. Okay, so I know this is a bite-sized thing. It's like your beer sampler. When you go to Oktoberfest and you say like there are 16 beers, you don't set in each one of them, get a gallon in each one of them. You basically get a sample in here, go to the next place. And, uh, my goal is to orient you. So we'll kind of switch gears a little bit. The second theme of the day is blockchain. I'm pretty sure this one's gonna go very fast because you guys are all educated on blockchain and cryptocurrencies and you already own a lot of cryptocurrencies and you've also probably made a lot of money or lost a lot of money. Um, so I'm gonna keep it simple. Uh, primarily, um, you know, a lot of companies asked us if we could build models to predict the, uh, the Bitcoin prices. And just to give you an idea, you know, this was uh, you know, when I did a meetup uh, two years ago. Uh, and, you know, Bitcoin was at like 4.3, 4.9. And uh, uh, in fact, there was an analyst from Goldman Sachs who had made a quote more or less when this came out that, you know, Bitcoin is going to go up another $500 and it will drop $400 after that. It's a very specific code. So, um, but yeah, and then uh, it went up to like 20,000 and um, stopped short of 20,000. Maybe people bought it at that level. I'm so sorry for you guys. But uh, again, nowadays it's trading at like, you know, 10,300, but now you have a lot of these products, you know, the, which basically there's a boom apparently in crypto insurance because uh, people claim that Bitcoin is going to go to 20,000 by Christmas. So um, I'm not going to talk about Bitcoin in this particular session. I'm probably going to just focus on primarily on blockchain. Uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, applications of blockchain, which uh, goes beyond just cryptocurrencies. And that's actually one of the things we are really fascinated about, especially you know, working in large financial companies where transaction processing and uh, the way in which information is shared across entities. And how do you kind of track the provenance of various innovations which are happening for various products and transactions? So that's becoming extremely important. So there were a lot of uh, you know very unique and uh, innovative use cases of blockchain. Um, but you also want to kind of think a little bit back to when I kind of you know put my academic hat and thought about like you know, what are the various ways in which some of these methodologies and mechanisms are being formalized and what is kind of the discussion of the day, if you will, you know, in like 1998, there was uh, you know, talk about what's called the experience economy. And at that point, you know, people talked about how various industries had evolved. So for example, if you look at a bakery, right? Um, you know, if you wanted to bake a cake, you know, 50 years ago, you had to get all the products, all the raw materials and kind of use the recipe and build that the thing. And when companies started to build out uh, ready to make cake mixes and products, some of them which basically said, just get the box, put in water, and put it in the oven, taste it pretty bad. And actually a lot of people did not want to get those products, basically saying, you know what, I don't enjoy this methodology of just getting this package and just putting water into it. I need to be able to like do something. So typically at that point, you know, we gravitate towards like, you know, having these boxes which say, well, don't just get the box, you still need eggs, water, and oil. And once you have all these things, you really get that experience of making something. Right? Uh, that was basically what was called as the experience economy, to basically help out uh, get those experiences. So apparently, um, with all of the technologies which are out there, you know, blockchain is um, it's kind of you know, getting there to you know, primarily in the context of identity experience. But then you also have you know, a lot of uh, different Business models come into play. You know, you have the Ubers of the world, the fast rabbits of the world, uh, the way we are sharing, the way we are actually looking at things. So, um, you know, uh, blockchain was meant to kind of facilitate some of these innovations also. Um, and then there was uh, this notion of a platform revolution, if you will. I mean, these are interesting books, and you kind of you know track these books and uh, you know, see how it matters to the technology at hand. Uh, but then you also see a lot of, um, you know, some of these research come in and go, if you will. Uh, so I'm kind of looking at 
blockchain, not just in the context of cryptocurrency, but how is it kind of influencing the whole ecosystem of new products and services which are coming out there? And uh, what does it mean in the context of uh, you know, traditional uh, services? Um, so if you look at uh, you know, what, what blockchain or uh, the origins is, obviously it started you know, with Bitcoin. And uh, does anybody have this person on LinkedIn? No, no one? No. Yeah. So I mean, I'm still trying to like, you know, add someone to that because it's not there. But um, anyways, for people who are relatively new to blockchain, uh, so basically what we are trying to do is we are using aspects of distributed computing you're using aspects of computer science, and we are basically creating an open distributed ledger. And the whole goal is to basically record transactions between two parties. Okay? So we want to have these transactions recorded and we do it in multiple ways. And the, the way we want to do it is primarily you know, factoring two aspects. One is verifiable, permanent. Okay? And uh, predominantly, if you just go to this link, it actually has a nice description of what blockchain is and how do you actually do it. And the, the reason why <clears throat> this technology is interesting is uh, you have a lot of different transactions which requires that you can't renege on this transaction. Right? And uh, those could be like certificates of ownership. Uh, for example, after four days, you're gonna get the Bond University mini certificate from FinTech Bootcamp. And you could basically create a copy and sell it to your friend. Right? We don't want to do that. Okay? So we want to have one form of certificate which is original. If you have a certificate of ownership, there's only one of those certificates, right? Uh, just kidding. Uh, but the point is, you want to have the statement of uh, authenticity. You want to have proof of a bank's financial information. So basically, these are some of the use cases out there. Uh, so this nice infographic actually walks you through how things are actually done. Um, I will share the slides and tomorrow when we meet again, I'm gonna go over some of it if uh, things were clear, we are very close to ones. But the key point here is you're basically making a transaction request and you have the miners who have NVIDIA GPUs and also our gamers in their spare time for basically using compute to do a very complex mathematical calculation. And then they basically kind of uh, uh, compete to put the place that block into these other transactions and once they solve the puzzle you basically have that block added to the chain and that's how it becomes the blockchain and once that's done analysis request to Bob send out you know, Bitcoin is actually done. So this is basically the Bitcoin transaction if you will but the same philosophy applies to any kind of digital transaction or request. So there's been a lot of talk about you know when art becomes more and more uh, popular, if you will. For example, uh, there was uh, a couple of months ago an artificial intelligence generated art piece was sold at like you know eighty thousand or ninety thousand dollars or some crazy amount. Uh, but the point here is, you know, when art becomes digital, and art is just bits and you know bytes, right? So how is it difficult to just basically trans, you know, just copy one digital asset to another digital asset? So in order to prevent that from happening, someone has to own the digital rights of that particular piece of art. So you know, people are talking about like, you know, leveraging Bitcoin, basically trans, you know, track that ownership. So the, um, this paper which came out in the March, April timeframe is a really good paper, which talks about the various blockchain applications. So if you have access to an academic uh, you know, uh, journal uh, at a university or uh, uh, you get it through other means, please look at it. it basically do a systematic review of where blockchain has been adopted you know, in various areas, including health, and internet of things, governance, financial, data management, business industry, privacy, et cetera. So there are very interesting applications which are coming out there. A couple of things to note, um, you know, we still don't have a killer application other than Bitcoin. Everybody's talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency futures and things like that, but blockchain definitely has a lot of interesting applications. Uh, we still don't have a killer application yet. But again, talking about blockchain is like talking about the internet in like the early 90s. Like the only thing we had in mind was like AOL. Oh, we can send email. You know, this is the power of internet. Why are we getting internet connections? To send email, right? Uh, but now you know what's the power of uh, uh, the internet. 
but then again, um, there's also obviously a very you know, large hype cycle, but this was an interesting study, you know, in, uh, I think this was 2016, 2017 timeframe, Deloitte did a study, and then uh, they basically tracked GitHub and other software platforms through which uh, these projects came up saying they're gonna do a blockchain-based project. And apparently 92% of the 26,000 blockchain-based projects which were started were shut down. Uh, so there are very few success stories of uh, blockchain-based products, if you will. Um, but again, there are a lot of interesting uh, uh, applications out there uh, on the web, especially you know, when you look at different graph-based architectures, you, know, you have like the centralized architectures, this is basically what's called a decentralized architecture, and you have a distributed architecture. Uh, so there are a lot of interesting ways in which you can position um, for the various applications, especially when you want to eliminate the middleman. And that's where the business model thinking comes in, wherein you would want to think about like, well, who's actually the person who's kind of being in the middle to facilitate these transactions? And why are we paying them a fee? And what is the service we're adding? Can we eliminate this middleman by using a blockchain? And we have a service which basically has that tracking built in where, and at that point, people would take more interesting applications. Um, so uh, primarily, there's a lot of thought about you know Bitcoin and blockchain kind of replacing a lot of uh, you know, services which are out there. Uh, but again, uh, you know some of the things you have to as a part of this four day event. You may want to go into many of these sessions which are talking about cryptocurrencies and blockchain and things like that to kind of understand where, uh, uh, where the value is and how you can actually leverage it. Okay, a couple of stories, uh, and I've shared some links uh, in here. Uh, so this is a complex uh, food chain, and uh, there's a lot of talk about, you, know, you want to understand your sources of food, food today food revolution, so you want to understand what you're eating on a daily basis. So there is basically a lot of talk about like, you know, tracking all these products and the processing which goes through so that in case there's a food recall, instead of just saying, oh, it came from this farm, and we need to basically say all the products coming out of that farm has to be disposed of throughout the country just because we don't know yet. And taking a precaution, please stop eating you know, anything which came out of this whole farm. It's typically the, the blanket approach we take nowadays. Uh, but if you can track it to the individual batch or the specific processing unit through blockchain, you know, you can make atomic decisions and prevent these catastrophic kinds of things when you take a, uh, let's just paint the whole thing approach. And there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, logistics related uh, applications and all when, as you can envision, there's a lot of process automation happening in the logistic in industry. You know, Amazon is now delivering one day shipping and it's not easy for humans to just kind of get in line Oh, the order came in and let's get there, let's transact, let's do this and then get you the product of the day. Most of it is happening through automation and logistics and various systems. But again, there's a lot of uh, uh, use cases like you know, fraud detection and prevention, theft detection, vehicle maintenance. You still have a lot of physical and moving pieces, not just the digital pieces in play. So blockchain will help you kind of you know, process those things where you know, here's an order to a delivery how can you process each one of these stages that way you can track all these aspects before you can get to the record point. And then, um, you know, insurance, you know, uh, tomorrow we're gonna hear a couple more stories from uh, Dee about uh, the various things in InsurTech. Again, uh, you know, traditionally, if you wanna buy a flight ticket, you give an option for, okay, here's an option for insurance and you buy it. And sometimes if your flight gets canceled then you're wondering, okay, what do I do? But again, here, there are a lot of granular options which could potentially be made available in the blockchain. Uh, for example, a flight uh, insurance company uh, that, that basically would have a smart contract. Um, so yeah, so there are a lot of uh, interesting use cases in the context of insurance too. And trading and settlement, especially if you are in a financial services company, you know the pain that you have to you know, think about when you trade an asset, how much processing it has to go through and uh, you know, you're still in the 1990s in terms of the, the amount of time you know, about you know, trade and settlement. Uh, there was this nice, um, you know, white paperish approach which talks about the distributed ledger technology for payment trading and settlement, but Bank of International System Settlements uh, gives you a good perspective of how, what's the traditional model, what's the trade validation, matching, confirmation, confirmation, uh, settlement, and, uh, you know, the key is to 
farming, which most of you in the industry will be familiar with. What does it mean when it comes to a decentralized system? You know, what actually happens between the various carbon parties? Uh, something to uh, think about. And then healthcare is uh, another very important uh, area. A lot of uh, very uh, interesting use cases, especially in terms of tracking you know, drugs and evolution of drugs and the testing that has gone through. Um, so you can, you can kind of foresee some of these applications, but also in terms of you know, privacy and rights about that, you know, if you're sharing your healthcare data, who's actually using it, how much are you enabling sharing of your data, and how can you track all those <coughs> aspects. That way you can maintain those uh, identity aspects and the, the privacy aspects which I talked about in terms of the experience economy, if you will. Um, that's another use case. And then predictive maintenance and tracking especially if you have worked in the product life cycle management area, you know, a car has you know, 20,000 plus parts. Uh, an airplane has many thousands of parts. You saw the Boeing typical you know, a few months ago. Uh, so you see uh, all these parts kind of coming together as a whole, but a single part, an influential part can basically grow up the whole uh, product. Okay. So the whole life cycle of the product needs to be managed in a very efficient way. And the uh, blockchain will give you the ability to kind of track the products, the evolution of the products, the versioning of the products, the SKUs, the manufacturer, uh, the, uh, all the key aspects required. That way you can manage the life cycle of the product very well. Okay, so um, there's a lot of uh, talk about, you know, raising money to ICUs and stuff like that. I kind of let the other panels talk about it. They've been more focused on those areas. And then um, there's a lot of talk about digital asset management, especially if you are transferring rights, you know, if you bought music, if you want to transfer the ownership of the music to a friend or other uh, entity, or you want to kind of, you know, a lot of people are buying our digital products nowadays. I mean, you know, if you want to think about inheritance and estate, you know, what does it mean? Am I just subscribing to music and renting the service on a monthly basis? Or if I'm buying music, what happens if I want to kind of you know, restore it to someone else? or I want to donate it to the library, or I don't want to donate it to another entity. All of those are interesting questions. So there's a lot of talk about using blockchain to basically track the ownership aspects of it so that you can make those transfers possible. So we wrote a white paper on blockchain for business and that's available on SlideShare. It was published in the Vermont Magazine uh, last year and uh, that's available for free if you want to download it. Okay, so uh, that's it for today. So it's, uh, it was a back session. Uh, you know, I just wanted to kind of get you started the first day. Uh, you are expected to attend all the four days if you want the certificate, uh, but you'll have access to the slides and you can, you can kind of you know, enjoy them uh, at your leisure. Um, plan for tomorrow, again, 11.30 sharp. We're going to get in here. We have two teams. Uh, we'll plan on talk about uh, insure tech and then uh, big data analytics and artificial intelligence. And Lee's going to come back. Uh, so he actually had a lot more material, so we kind of you know, split it into the two parts. So we're going to talk a little bit about mature tech, the insights of mature tech tomorrow. Okay. So that's the plan for tomorrow, and I uh, hope to see you back tomorrow again. Thank you. Thank you.